Smooshy Moshy. Hello. I'm Zeb Ramswatham. And I'm Annie Ramswatham. And we're the Rambling Ramswathams. Our journey might be rambling, but we hope this podcast isn't. And last week, we talked about Zeb's biggest bike ride, and guess what? He did it. I did it. <laughs> I really did, didn't I? Yeah, so if you didn't listen last week, that's fine. We talked about how Zeb was going to do a 500-kilometer um, effort. And see if he could actually make it from the Sea of Japan to the Pacific Ocean. And he did, in one ride. So yeah, we'll start with what kind of an overview of what the ride was. Like the what, where, and how long and everything. And then I'll ask you some questions. An interview even. <laughs> yeah, I'll interview you on the biggest takeaways, best part, hardest part, all that. And then we'll talk about Wakayama as a whole, which is the prefecture that you rode to. And some other fun stuff about the weekend that we had down in Wakayama. Yeah, it was a good good time. Yeah, so first of all, what was it? What, what were you even doing? <laughs> so we talked about this, I guess, some in the last episode, so I'll try and be moderately brief. Yeah, um, just the facts. Yeah, so it was a 505-kilometer ride. It's like 313 miles for... It's like 315 miles. Oh, excuse me. I think it's 314. So I'm going to round up <laughs> and approximately like 11,000 feet of climbing. I think it was 3,500 some meters Which of not elevation. to take anything away from the ride, but I'm surprised that it was that little. Wow. Okay. No, I'm just. Mm, all right. <laughs> Feeling a little slighted. Yeah. No, okay. and not as a slight. I just, I am because in the middle of Honshu, there's the, the Alps. Well, that's, I rode to the south mm. of the Alps. Um, I mean, the distance is like ridiculous because it took me six and a half hours in a car to drive what you rode in how many hours? So it was right at about like 17 and a half hours moving time, but total time was a little under 20 hours. So it was like 19 hours and 48 minutes or something like that. So yeah, 505 kilometers. 3,500 meters and about 20 hours of time. Yeah, and the where part of it was from Uchinada, which is, you know, where we live outside Kanazawa on Ishikawa Prefecture's um, Sea of Japan coastline. And then you rode southwest, a little bit southwest, to the Pacific Ocean, and specifically the tip of the Key Peninsula, which is um, Wakayama Prefecture. Yeah, and it's it was kind of like an interesting stopping point, too, because it's Honshu's southernmost point. Yeah, and Honshu um, is just the name of the main, like the central biggest island of Japan. Yeah, so that was kind of not as, like I didn't go there because it was the southernmost point, but it was yeah. just an interesting... It's like a bonus fun fact, you can say. Yeah, it was like a neat (laughs) landmark. Um, Basically, I'd just been like scrolling around on Google Maps and looking at beaches because my initial idea was, you know, it'd be nice to ride to a beach where Mm -hmm. I could like touch the water. But then there were a couple issues with that. One, in the morning, I was planning on, I was like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I could touch the Sea of Japan Mm -hmm. and then go all the way to the other side and touch the ocean on the other side? Yeah. Well, one, we've joked about this before, but the beach at Uchinada is like absurdly long. Mm-hmm. Like it takes 10 minutes. It feels like 10 minutes just mm-hmm. to like walk across the beach before you can get the water. Yeah, it's a super long beach. So in reality, I wasn't actually going <laughs> to You definitely that. can't bike down the beach. You'd have no. to like walk in your little clip-clop bike shoes. <laughs> yeah. And so. then, yeah, the finishing point was more of like a rocky shoreline Mm -hmm. but i did kind of far away from the water like more vertically far away from the water yeah but i touched the water on the 13th (laughs) so the night before because i left work and we went and had a picnic at the beach so it was nice touched the water um then i touched the water the day after my ride Mm -hmm. i guess a couple days after my ride we went swimming yeah which we'll get to in a little bit once we talk about like after the weekend how we got back home yeah but that was kind of the whole thing and you can listen to the last episode where i talk more about the why yeah so i won't really repeat the why but basically it was just a challenge that i was interested in doing and if you'd like to know more about that 
listen to episode 107. Yeah, but this is all about the he did it part of it. <laughs> I know. It's kind of like the Antake race where it really is. It's like the the main feeling is almost relief. Yeah. So Because you were worried you wouldn't be able to do it? I don't know. I, like, to be honest, I was reasonably confident that I could. But that, I well, guess yeah, that was part of the... I mean, I don't the... think you would plan something thinking, like, I probably can't. But the exciting part about goals is that you probably can, but there's, like, enough doubt that you're not really sure. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an exciting goal. Well, yeah, and I, I've, like, thought about this, too, that that's one of the fun things about this type of, like, ride or this type of challenge is that it's more obviously like a personal challenge there's this you know there's like a feeling of anticipation and nervousness that you get before a race like Mm -hmm. when you're on the way to the start line or you're lining up but so much of that involves the unknowns that are due to the other people that are there Mm -hmm. so this was like interesting because like i wasn't going to get dropped by anyone no one was going to attack and ride away from me And I wasn't going to be in like a sketchy situation because we're on like a really fast descent and I'm in a pack of other riders. Yeah. And so there's an endurance mountain bike race. I guess so. Yeah. More like a marathon mountain bike race or something. But yeah, it's like, so that was like interesting because I had this whole other feeling of nervousness and anticipation Mm -hmm. that was very different from. Because if you fail, it's a lot more on you. You can't blame like, oh, I got crashed out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then also like the constraints that I was dealing with, there yeah. was, I wasn't like fighting for a podium place or hoping for like a good result. You're just fighting the daylight. <laughs> yeah. I just, all I needed to do was finish, which I was reasonably confident I could. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was like part of the challenge was like, well, I think I can. And it's one of those things where like, yeah, I think I could run a marathon, but well, then yeah. it's so I until was you worried. do it. I didn't think you couldn't do it, but Uh, I was worried about... Some doubts. No, I was worried about you. I know how stubborn of a person you are. (laughs) And so I was worried that you were going to like be too stubborn that when it got to a point where it was unsafe to continue, you were going to be like, no, I'm just going to keep going. And what I mean is like, I was afraid of like heat exhaustion and like you getting too dehydrated or like, I don't know what... I don't know what the human body does if you just like keep biking for 20 hours. So, I mean, you were fine because you know how to continue to take on calories and how to drink water. But I think sometimes if you like heat plays a huge role in your body's ability to process calories that you put into it and process water and stuff. And so I was kind of worried when it got hot, you'd already been on the bike for 10 hours. Like, I don't know. I didn't want to get too far because I drove ahead of you but I didn't want to get too far ahead and be like okay he's showing some like heat exhaustion heat stroke signs like I don't know if he's gonna be smart but you were fine I just kind of an overthinker anyway yeah that's interesting because for me that was like never a concern well the other concern in a race I would be much more likely to push myself beyond the limit like I've but been a race much... is such a fixed point in time like yeah but it's not anywhere close to a 20-hour effort yeah but the closest I've ever been to like heat exhaustion or like serious issue was in a race yes because you but can't you're also so stop. close to an ambulance and like care <laughs> I mean I was riding through like cities and stuff I just think in a race like you can't stop where that's what I'm saying about the personal goal is I had the freedom to stop because there was no pressure to continue. So if I didn't feel good, I could either just ride slower for a little bit and like wait until I feel better Mm -hmm. or I could just stop at a convenience store. But in a race when like someone is riding away from you or you're chasing another rider. Well, you can't just stop. Well, not if you want to do well. No, but which I'm is talking the whole about like, reason you're there. Yeah, but I'm talking about like so the incentive beyond is the much point, higher. Beyond the point of wanting to do well, where like your body is kind of shutting down, you know, where it's not just like a willpower thing. But anyway, the other thing that I was worried about was cars, which you can never, you can never really be safe. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean it in like such a negative way, but you can never always in danger. You can never control what the cars are going to do around you. And you're always on live roads when you're road cycling. So there's always that risk. But I was worried that halfway through the ride, you'd be very fatigued. And you were going to be on some pretty busy roads halfway through the ride when kind of the main island of Honshu gets really narrow between like 
around Kyoto, it kind of bottlenecks a bit. And so if you're going to Nagoya or Kyoto, you have to go on more narrow roads until they split off onto those two areas. And so a lot of truck traffic goes through there. And I was worried that you were going to run through that little area, be pretty tired, and like trucks were going to be, I don't know, it was mid-afternoon at that point on a Friday. And I was just concerned that people were going to be impatient. You were going to be less reactive because <laughs> you'd have fatigue. I didn't but, know you had all these concerns. Well, I try not to think about it too much. I don't think I had that many <laughs> Well, concerns. it's a good thing because I have concerns enough for the both of us. I probably have more concerns that are necessary, so I'll balance this out. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, what were the... Um, I mean, luckily none of that happened and you were fine. And you started the ride at... at you woke up at midnight, started the ride at 12.45 at night, and then you finished the ride. I met you at, I think, 8 or 8.30 p.m. Yeah, I finished like day. right at 8.30. So yeah, I left... I was like leaving the apartment at 12.45. And then, yeah, I was out there for 20 hours until 8.30, basically. Yeah. What were the hardest parts? The only part that I really struggled with was like kilometer 320 to 380. That was the only hours, time that I felt bad. How many hours in was that? Um, like, Got to be like over halfway. So well, yeah. 12 hours in. Yeah, it was probably like 12 or 13 hours. That makes sense because that's also the heat of the day. Because that would be around like one or two o'clock. Yeah, I don't think the, honestly, it wasn't that hot. The high was only like 84 hmm. Fahrenheit, like 30 Celsius or something. That's good. So the heat really wasn't that bad. I think, I think I got like slightly off my nutritional plan unintentionally. Mm -hmm. So I think I ended up in like a bit of a like bigger deficit than I'm meant to be in at that point. How many calories were you trying to eat every hour? I don't know how many calories. So I was trying to eat, I was trying to take in 85 grams of carbohydrates every hour. I looked at your data at the end and you burned 10,000 something calories for the day. Yeah. So it's a lot of things you have to like, I know you're not supposed to replenish one to one. You can't on the bike, but well, yeah, you just physically can't, but you do have to like continue to take in food when you're not hungry, when you're doing a kind of endurance effort like that. Was it harder to keep calories or fluid topped up? I don't think either, to be honest. That's good. I guess I would like say calories because like I just said, I think I messed up a little bit. But I think it's because I like got slightly off track. And I think I got off track because the only like the annoying part during the ride was in kind of like from... Like Mie Prefecture? Really from Shiga Prefecture. So probably from around kilometer like 160 and to probably about 320 right when I felt bad. And in case you don't know the geography of Japan as much, Shiga Prefecture has Lake Biwa in it. And it's also just north of... But if of, they don't know the geography of Japan, well, it, that's it's <laughs> not going to help them. It's just north of Kyoto and Osaka. Yeah. So that part was really busy with a lot of traffic. And so I think just in the frustration of like riding through traffic and having to deal with that, I think I just like wasn't paying attention to regularly drinking and eating like I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And so I think around like kilometer 320, I realized like, oh yeah, I don't actually like feel that good. Like I was starting to feel like maybe I was going to bonk or maybe I needed more food. Mm -hmm. So right at that point, like I just ate like three gels and then stopped a little bit early than my original plan stop at a convenience store. Because you had scheduled which convenience stores you were going to stop at, right? Yeah, I scheduled the ideal ones. And so my ideal stop was like kilometer 374. Yeah, you um, scheduled out like the specific store you were going to stop at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And That's then good. I stopped, I think I ended up stopping at a kilometer like 360. So only like 15 kilometers early, but there happened to be a store That's good. that I saw. And I was like, well, I should just go ahead and stop. And so I did and I ate some ice cream <laughs> and got some other stuff. And then it was like pretty soon after that, around kilometer 380, I started feeling like better again. And then from there until the finish, I felt like honestly relatively good mm -hmm. considering, I guess, you know, like how long yeah. I'd been out there. 
You didn't have any like headphones or anything. Did you get bored? No. That's good. Just me and me in the open road. <laughs> yeah, cuz I mean and it it'd be hard to even describe like what I was thinking about. Yeah. Cuz I don't really I mean I was out there for 20 hours, but mm -hmm. It's like moving meditation kind of. I guess to a certain extent, because like you're pretty involved, obviously, in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So it is a good time to not really think, but then you kind of are thinking. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the thing where thoughts are just like coming and going in your head, but you're not really like latching on to any of them. Well, and because you had a, a goal, you were probably in the back of your mind thinking about like how much you needed to eat and like when you needed to stop. And it was all new roads after Fukui prefecture so after yeah i like, think out of the 314 miles i think 280 of the miles were new because i have cool. this thing that tracks when i ride new roads <laughs> and so it like had this little like congratulations that was like 278 new miles or something hmm. so yeah it was like I, I didn't really have time to be bored <laughs> yeah like bored i did <laughs> think good. that maybe at one point i would mm-hmm potentially feel bored just because i mean it is like it's just so long to be yeah. out there but i never did and it just kind of i would have to have moments where maybe my thoughts i could tell that they were trending a little more negative yeah specifically when i was in traffic and i was like really like really like steeping in some hatred for japanese Cars. truck drivers <laughs> yeah specifically the truck drivers they do so, buzz bikes pretty close for whatever reason like even when there's room in the other lane they don't get over <laughs> yeah i noticed i was like really honing in on a lot of trends that i was noticing that were you know fairly negative about drivers so i did have quite a few instances where i mm. did need to like tell myself like okay like you have to you need to pick a new thought because if you keep thinking about that you're just gonna be in a bad mood for the yeah. rest of the ride so I did and have some moments like that where I was like, okay, I do need to consciously steer my thoughts a little bit. Yeah, that's hard to do when you're tired too. But Wakayama Prefecture specifically, they made this Pacific cycling route and they pr are promoting it, not largely, but they have promoted it as a bike path and Wakayama Prefecture has hundreds of kilometers of dedicated bike path. And that is like, very misleading, which is unfortunate because Wakayama Prefecture is one of the most beautiful prefectures that I've ever biked in. And I feel like we've ridden a lot of different places and a lot of varied terrain in Japan. And it has some really cool roads. None of those roads are, are these like air quotes designated bike paths because what they've done is they just put the little blue arrows on the like roads that are closest to the coast like the main routes and we yeah. would typically call those like share rows because it's just an arrow that means you're supposed to share the road and there's no shoulder so when the cars yeah. buzz you there's nowhere you could go it's very frustrating because it makes it seem like walking is not a good place to ride because if you go down there and you're like oh i'm gonna ride on these designated bike paths because somebody made this route for cyclists this must be the best bike road that Wakayama has to offer and it's not at all and right next to the road which you wouldn't know unless you looked at a map and saw that like there's a parallel road or if you looked at Strava and saw a heat map which is what we usually are able to do if you just rode down there you wouldn't know but the road next to the designated bike road is so much better because it's not the main driving road so there's less cars on it it's like often yeah, quieter I don't, I don't really know, know it's just crazy. who like, I don't, it would be interesting to see. Obviously, I don't think a cyclist, a person that, it, and I do think that honestly, like cycling as in what we do, like more sport oriented cycling, I don't think is well understood as a whole in Japan. And I don't think the person that implemented the cycle routes in Wakayama is a cyclist. Yeah. And even it's even funny because on the cycle routes, the imagery they use are people on like mama charis. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, it's fine if they're not really a road cyclist or a touring cyclist. That's fine. But even fine, then, I think it would be more dangerous for an individual that's I like know. a recreational. Like, if I you were on a mama, mama char on, on one those of those roads, roads <laughs> yeah, it would not be an ideal situation. Yeah. 
So that was maybe like the unfortunate, like the biggest negative about the day as a whole Mm -hmm. is that honestly the route like wasn't that inspiring. There were some like really beautiful parts. And so throughout the day there were, you know, these like super beautiful vistas. You said the descent out of Fukui was really pretty. Yeah. Honestly, the whole morning was super nice. Like riding through just like, 2 a.m. was really nice (laughs) because obviously there's like no traffic there's no one around um i did ride through like some really beautiful places and yeah just that part was great Mm -hmm. but then the rest of it was like punctuated by really beautiful areas and really beautiful roads but then i would be on these like main kind of like routes Mm -hmm. and that part was less than ideal yeah so i wouldn't i probably i wouldn't do this route again i would maybe do another ride like this again but not that That exact road yeah so the besides the views in the morning was there a best part of the whole like experience Mm, i mean i don't i don't like i think just the experience as a whole was the best part just the feeling of completing it yeah and just knowing that i was like capable of doing it and There's also like a lot of satisfaction with, you know, like organizing that plan and creating a plan and then executing. Yeah. Like executing the plan or whatever. Yeah. So that was like satisfying that I was able to like make this agenda and then follow it and then be successful. So it's kind of hard. Like I definitely think it's, I'm kind of on the fence because like I, I, I would maybe call it type two fun, Mm -hmm. but I think for type two fun, you have to be a lot more miserable. Usually (laughs) I was honestly never really miserable. That's good. I was like pretty, pretty, except for that one stretch, like from 320 to 380. That was like the time where I was like, okay, maybe I'm not going to feel good for the Mm -hmm. remainder of the ride. But then I kind of came back to life. Other than that, I really never... I was never in like doubt, Mm -hmm. like the whole time. So besides the road, like changing the route was, there's nothing else you would really do differently about the ride. I don't think so. That's good. To be honest. Like, I think, I mean, I think everything worked out. I mean, really like as well as I could have hoped. I might add in like maybe more like an additional stop, an additional plan stop Mm -hmm. or two. And I think if I ever did it again, I would be more strict with my time. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about like being out there for 17 and a half hours, just like as moving time. Yeah. And then there were two hours of stop time. If I could even limit the stop time by an additional like 30 minutes, Mm -hmm. that would be huge. So, and originally my goal was only an hour of stop time, but there was a stop. I think when I got lunch like around 260 kilometers in the middle Mm -hmm. i don't even know what i was doing but i was there for like 30 minutes like i went (laughs) back and like looked through the data and i was just like at that 7-eleven for a really long time Mm -hmm. and somehow that time passed really quickly yeah but if i had and i one of the things i wasn't doing well was not keeping track of like what time i stopped Mm -hmm. and then you know like i wasn't wearing a watch oh so I wasn't like keeping time. Yeah, I should have been keeping time. It is better. nice that in Japan there's so many convenience stores, and then also, did you ever use um, vending machines? Like unplanned, run out of water and need to stop at a vending machine. I didn't have an, any unplanned running out of water, but it was part of my plan that, like as needed, I would stop at a vending machine. So usually, what I would do is if I got if I finished one bottle, I would immediately be like on Looking the lookout for, for vending machines. Mm. And then if I saw one and it was super convenient, I kind of just automatically stopped and just filled up one bottle. Hmm. So that was like another thing I did is I did stop at a lot of vending machines. What was the best thing you ate when you were on the bike? Maybe I think, you didn't even eat. You just ate gels. No, when I stopped for lunch, I got three onigiri. And I, from a 7-Eleven, I got a banana ice bar. Which is pretty good. That's an interesting flavor choice. It just I've never seen good. you get in a banana ice bar. I've never seen it before. Oh. It was literally like they had blended up bananas and then froze <laughs> them on a stick. Sounds good. 
Well, now that you've finished your main bike goal, do you have a new bike goal? I mean, it's pretty soon after, so maybe you don't already. So I think, and I don't like, I don't like, I don't want this to sound weird or I don't know, like I'm not being humble, but I keep doing these rides, assuming that they're going to be too hard for me to complete. And maybe this is how people end up doing crazy stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. But so far, I've finished it feeling relatively good, Mm -hmm. which kind of leaves me with the feeling of like, oh, well, I could have done more, or maybe I should have tried harder, or maybe I could do it faster. So I guess I keep looking for the point of like failure. Like, it's not that I want to fail, like I I want to (laughs) complete it. But I do, I guess like in looking for my own limit, I haven't reached it yet. So there is part of me that does want to know. But do you really? Because you could have planned a ride that I think would have been easier to fail. Like, I didn't really think, like, I never had any doubt you were not going to be able to finish this ride. Like, I was like, yeah. Some worries. <laughs> I had worries that external factors were going to play into it. But I was like, I mean, you've trained for it. It's not unrealistic, you know? Well, I didn't really train for this, But it to doesn't be seem fun to do a goal that is probably not going to work out, you know? Well, that's why I thought that this one was like an interesting one. Cause it was long enough that I, I had never done anything like this. So yeah, I don't know how to explain it because like there's something interesting about finding how far you can push yourself. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, ultimately that's like what I could do is just say, well, I'm going to do 24 hours of riding. So I'm going to wake up. See how far you can go in 24 hours. Yeah. Like I'm going to wake up at 1130, start riding my bike. I don't want to have to drive eight hours, come pick you up somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so I'm not really a fan of that goal. (laughs) Well, in that case, maybe I would like try and plan it. Do a loop. Just do (laughs) different loops. Well, see, then that sounds like boring. Yeah. So yeah, I think I don't necessarily have like an immediate goal. Yeah. But I guess I would potentially do something like this again in the future. Yeah. But maybe I would have like an additional goal of. Well, maybe I'll do 500 Beat kilometers again, but yeah, maybe I could do it faster or yeah. maybe I would add more climbing or maybe, yeah, next time I'm like, well, I, maybe I can do 600 kilometers in 24 yeah. hours. No, I think that's fair. And I think it's kind of an unfair question to ask too, when you've just finished something that's very impressive that you've like worked for. I mean, I don't think it's very healthy to always be asking ourselves, like, what can we do better instead of just giving ourselves time to be like... I really like, look at what I, look how far I've come, you know? I mean, then that can be for anything. It doesn't have to be some like lifetime bike goal. It can be for like anything. (laughs) I do have moments where I do like, I do think about what I did and it does seem moderately unbelievable. Obviously it's not because people have done this. Like I'm not the only person that's ever done anything like this. Um, but someone did make a comment on my Strava ride that was funny. They said something about like, man, it looks like you left your GPS on and got in your car. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that. I was like, I wonder if there are people that looked at it and did think that that's because, you know, sometimes if you've had a friend that's done that, where all of a sudden it'll post and it'll be like, they did a like 500 mile ride. And it's like, wow. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, they left their GPS. on. That only happens if it's like, wow, their mountain bike ride was 60 miles per hour. You know, like that's the only time I'm like, "Mm, I don't think it was, but yeah. So, yeah. So I have some, I do have some moments where I am really proud of myself Mm -hmm. and I do feel really good about it. But then also it is interesting because like part of me, and I mentioned this in my little like cheesy Instagram post, part of me really is like, well, since I did it, it couldn't, it wasn't really that hard because I was able to do it. Like all of life, you know, you're just like, oh, I got to like figure this out. Like we're all just alive for the first time. Like, I don't know how to do anything. Then like, you know, when you're a kid and you're like, wow, my parents are like superheroes. And like my parents, they are both role models for me. But like, you do realize at one point, like they're also just humans. Like everybody here is just trying to like figure it out. So I don't know. A lot of things are just kind of like, I don't know if I can do it. And then you do it. And then you just move on to the next thing. And you just keep doing things you didn't know if you could do. Yeah. So that's a little bit how I feel with this is like, yeah, yeah, I didn't know I could do it, 
But, now but this I know is I more impressive than just your regular, like, well, I don't know if I can, like, make it to the grocery store in Japan, <laughs> wow. which is kind of what my, like, initial goals were, but... Yeah. Yeah, I think it's great. So, yeah, I feel I'm, I am, like, really happy with it. It is just, yeah, kind of, I guess, does create, like, a little bit of confusion about, yeah, okay, well, yeah, what do I want to Well, I don't do think you have to, or... like, rush into figuring out a new goal. I was just curious if you already had one. Why don't, yeah, I don't think I need to either, but, I mean, yeah, obviously when I finished took a little bit of time to think about it but then yeah i had some secondary thoughts about like okay like what could i have done better what would i do if i did this again yeah and of course it is interesting to think about i've i have already looked that there are some like fastest known times for certain like cycling routes that are like long distance Mm -hmm. and part of it's like kind of cheesy because some of it is like no one really cares yeah. about the fastest time because it is so long so not many people are interested yeah, in doing I know what you it mean. like there's no really set time because nobody has done it before yeah so then part of me is like well since there is no real set time like <laughs> i'll set a time yeah like maybe i could set a time so i have looked sure. kind of at stuff like that i mean um, that's cool so who knows maybe that's my future but we'll see well after you did the whole very structured ride thing on this was friday because you took friday off work we had the whole rest of the weekend to just kind of hang out and we had saturday all day in wakayama and then sunday we spent a really leisurely time getting back to ishikawa but we were staying in this guest house that i think you found it on like booking.com or something yeah i think it was just on booking it was cheaper than a hotel and kind of the nice part about the fact that you just picked this southernmost point in Wakayama is that it wasn't necessarily a destination town like there was some stuff to look at but there was not really any attractions there was there were nice beaches but it was nothing like oh come to the like resort area of the peninsula which is interesting because they do have have really nice beaches well they have really nice beaches they have really nice onsen yeah. They have really nice fish. They're also... And they have, like, temples and shrines that are so old. Well, I was going to say that they're very close to some very famous temples and shrines with the Kamano Kodo. And so I feel like they're an hour away from things that people would go to for a destination. So yeah, if they're, they're going also, that far, they're probably going there, not to the southernmost point. Yeah, they're not far from, like, Isejingu either, which is, like, the most powerful shrine in Japan. Yeah, that one's a bit contentious but yeah yeah and it's also not far from nara so kind of yeah there are like bigger tourist hot spots to go to well it was great for us because the hotels were cheap but also this guest house was cheap because it was just across the street from this guy's house and i guess he had fixed up this other property that he had yeah and i think we also lucked out because it looked like he's fairly new to Mm -hmm. the rental you know business and so i think it's probably one of those places that in a few years will be booked a lot or will be I hope be it is because the guy price. was very kind, very welcoming, and the place was immaculate. Like, it, it was so clean. And it was a, um, I don't know, like a studio apartment almost. I mean, it was a separate guest house. And so you walk in and there's the kitchen living room area. And then there's a separate It was almost room. like a single wide trailer. It was kind of like the... <laughs> Like the Japanese equivalent of a single wide trailer. (laughs) Yeah. And then there was a bathroom with a really nice bath and shower, um, toilet sink, all the stuff you really needed. So there wasn't like... you need, shower, (laughs) toilet sink. (laughs) But it was so much bigger than just a hotel room. We had a full kitchen and that was really nice to just, especially because on Saturday it it rained. So we just had kind of a cozy afternoon, but... Yeah, I don't know if I left the house on Saturday. You didn't because I went on my own No, I did because then we went to eat dinner. No, we didn't eat dinner out that... Oh, yeah, we... Wait. Yeah, we did. Is that the night we ate at the American mm-hmm. restaurant? Yeah. So Zeb found this American restaurant. It was more like Tex-Mex American food. If you're... It was like Tex-Mex, but Japan. Well, it's hard to just make an American restaurant because there's America's so big. But this was kind of like Tex-Mex food, and it was called an American restaurant. But it was really tasty. So there was taco rice and tacos and pizza, french fries... Um, but then the inside looked kind of like a New York diner, but I was a fan <laughs> it was good. and all the food came with these tiny little American flags on it, which was really funny. And they had huge milkshakes, which we didn't get one, but I'll still be thinking about that milkshake. I was, gotten one. I was too full. Like we had the, it was also fairly combo. expensive. It was It's one of the more expensive 
dinners <laughs> I feel like we've had <laughs> recently. Yeah, it was comparatively expensive. But Which was kind of funny because it was like, why does it cost so much? But, I didn't really mind because the novelty of like, oh, look, it's an American restaurant. Yeah. And we haven't had like tacos in forever. But um, yeah, so I guess we did go out that day. But earlier that day the, in the morning, I went on my own ride because um, you were... I didn't expect you to get, want to get back on the bike that next day. So I planned a route to go to Nachi Taisha, which we were just talking about how many shrines and temples there are in that area. And the Kumano Kodo, which we talked about that the last time we went to Wakayama. Back in November. Yeah, it's a famous pilgrimage route. Uh, you can't ride a bike on it, but it is very famous for walking. And it connects. There's multiple routes that you can choose, but it connects these temples and shrines throughout Mostly Wakayama. I think Mie Prefecture as well. I think there's one route that goes into Mie. Mm. But yeah, there's three main shrines in the Kumano Kodo, the Kumano Sanzan. And we saw the other two. And so this time we, we got to see the final one, Nachi Taisha. Well, you did. I didn't go. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So, <laughs> maybe next time. Yeah, but this is the one that we hadn't seen. And it's maybe the most photographed one only because it's got not only because but mainly because it's got the tallest waterfall in japan which is very dramatic and photogenic yeah but it's 133 meter like very dramatic just straight down cliff waterfall and if you stand at this uh bright orange pagoda you can photograph the pagoda and the waterfall which i mean what else are you looking for so it's japan yeah <laughs> So that was very scenic. And like I mentioned earlier, it was rainy that day and it rained for half of my ride, which is a bit of a bummer, but it was very like mystical feeling, you know, it gives the little, um, mystical ambiance when you're in a, a cloudy, misty area. Cloud. Yeah. So that was, that was interesting, but it, those temples, so the Taisha, it's a shrine, but it's kind of an example of a fusion between Buddhism and Shintoism, because right next to the shrine is this Buddhist temple, Seigan Toji. And so, yeah, there's a lot of examples of the fusion between the two religions, not only at um, Nachi Taisha, but all Yeah, it's pretty common like, throughout Japan, too. Like most temples and shrines, or many temples and shrines share real estate. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was a nice ride. I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't see it, but I told you all about it. I gave you kudos on Strava. Yeah, I did get a little the futon. like cold and wet on the way back, but it was definitely still worth it. And then the next day, we luckily the rain cleared and I had been wanting to swim in the Pacific Ocean and we got to do that. And so on our drive home, we stopped, I don't know, just 30 minutes down the road at this um beach. I think it was called Tamanoura. And it was just, yeah, just this random kind of pull off. Well, it wasn't random. I mean, it was designated as a beach, but it didn't, it wasn't open technically until July, but it was of course a beach. So it's open to the public, but the, there are usually bathrooms and showers that are open, which is, would have been even nicer. Yeah. I say random just because in general, it comparatively like on the Wakayama coast, there are mm -hmm. so many beaches that have like thousands of Google reviews oh, yeah. and people are like, you should go to this beach and this is the best beach. This one was much smaller. And like this the parking one lot was very small. Yeah. It was kind of like one that seems like it's kind of in between much more well-known beaches. So this one maybe falls through the cracks. So people don't really go there very often. So that's why I say random. It was kind of well, just, and also there weren't like hotels or anything there. You it know wasn't, what it did have. It did have Japan's shortest river. Yeah, I got to see Japan's longest waterfall and shortest river. <laughs> and when Zeb told me that it had the shortest river, I was like, well, that's ridiculous. So they just like named some stream. But I guess they designated it a river because you can see the start. You can see where the groundwater comes up and it's fresh water coming out of like just the ground in this spring. And then you can see, you can follow it to the ocean where it just, goes into the water so that yep. that was kind of cool like more than i expected it to be cool yeah. because it's 13 and a half meters long yeah which i think is like 30 feet i've just never been able like to that. like see groundwater coming out of like fresh groundwater yeah like where you could they say you can drink it we didn't drink yeah, it google reviews are like you can drink it i don't think my constitution's strong enough to just nah. drink it out of the water but and that river would devastate <laughs> you but it was cool because you could see even the little wildlife change like there were little fish and things up by the stream 
And um, then while you would walk down the stream, it was cold, like fresh river water. And then as you're walking in the water and you're walking on kind of clay mud type stuff with more like green algae, it was turning into warmer brackish water as you walked in like towards the ocean. And there were little shrimp critters that you could start to see on the sides and crabs and things and then magical experience yeah and then you finally get to the ocean and the water is warm because you're in this the ocean now and it's salt water all of a sudden it was it was pretty interesting little ecosystem right there yeah aren't you always stop well i'm mostly i mean the river was cool but i mostly was really happy that i got to swim in the ocean it was the ocean was nice yeah yeah it was and it was like the perfect there weren't really any big waves and it was fairly shallow for a really long time yeah so you could like walk through the water and enjoy it without getting you could just float. crushed by waves also the river had a name butsu butsu and i was telling my friends about it and i didn't know that butsu butsu is what is like slang for grumbling like yeah. complaining about something apparently i was someone in a google review said that normally you say like hutsu hutsu but butsu butsu is like a dialect that People in that area specifically say butsu butsu. About what though? Oh, I don't know. Well, because I told my friends that I was like, oh, well, Zeb said it was some kind of dialect thing. And they're like, maybe so. But they had never heard. They they were like, the only thing we know is that butsu butsu means grumbling, hmm. <laughs> like complaining. Yeah, I would have to look up the like the Google reviews again to read it. Yeah. It was just what someone said. Just maybe a grumpy that, little river. Yeah. And maybe that person was like confused. Maybe they don't know what they're talking about. I don't know. But on the, on the way back, um, so after we, we changed and which also Zeb didn't know this because he only goes in the boy bathrooms and I go in the girl bathrooms. Well, yeah, I've never (laughs) been in the ladies room. (laughs) I've never (laughs) gone in there to see what's happening. Well, yeah. What are y'all up to in here? No, I know. I know. But he doesn't know. And for whatever reason, the girls bathroom only has this, there's like a little changing table for adults where it's really nothing more than just a piece of plastic you can stand on that is usually leaned up against the wall and you can fold it down and then you stand on that and so you can change in the bathrooms without having to put your feet on the floor which i don't know if you've ever changed in a bathroom and you have to like stand on top of your shoes kind of to like awkwardly all the time yeah in the men's rooms we don't have the plastic sheet well in the women's rooms they've solved this worldwide problem i don't know why they don't put one in the men's rooms i guess they're like the men don't need to change well, the men can like, put their nasty feet on the nasty floor <laughs> why are why are y'all blowing your clothes out so much i don't know but I've, why are women just it's such a, a epidemic that you gotta have the changing room i don't know there. but i appreciate it because i use it all the time whenever i i don't know all why the time. I, I need to change all the time <laughs> Just got to change my clothes. Blowing those things out all the time. But yeah, we swam in the ocean. And then I was like, how convenient. There's a convenience store right here. I'll just run into the women's room, put the little plastic thing down and change right there. This is where in this podcast, someone's going to explain to you that that's not what that's for. You know, it has like an infographic on the plastic sheet of a lady like standing on it, like changing her Hmm. pants. I could just imagine someone like sending in a message and being like actually no that's for (laughs) actually don't touch (laughs) that you're not supposed to use that or someone's going to tell me that apparently they're in men's rooms and i've just never noticed yeah you're just not observant yeah maybe i'm not observant (laughs) but we really we don't have them so when you were explaining this to me i was confused so we did we we changed we continued driving i think we stopped a couple other times for like oh we stopped at a roadside like a michinoaki roadside Mm -hmm. station which it was fine. There were no other real options. It, there's a bit of countryside driving from Wakayama back to, like, I guess, kind of the Mie, or even through Mie, it, back into the Well, Shige really, area. we didn't want to get off the expressway. And for some reason, the roadside stops, like, on the expressway there didn't have convenience stores. Yeah. In a so, lot of places, there will be a convenience store, like, off the expressway. But, yeah. But at almost every Michinoeki, even if there's not a convenience store, there is... A place where you can it's not fast food but it's like japan fast food yeah it's like ramen yeah or like just quick noodles you just buy a ticket at the window and then they make your noodle dish really quickly and you eat it right there and then you get back on the road so we did that for lunch and then zeb was very nice to wait for me in the car while i did a quick like hour and a half ride in fukui and um yeah it was really pretty so i'll just talk yeah, about this quickly but 
The Tojimbo Cliffs are this little spot in Fukui outside of Awara Onsen. And there's a small island called Oshima, which actually means big island. Yeah, I was going like, to say, does that mean big island? It literally means big island, but I mean, I guess it's a relatively big island because it says on Google that you, it'll take about an hour to walk around the two kilometer path. It's a big island. Yeah, it's massive. But um, it's, it is not that big, but it's connected to the mainland by this long red bridge. And you know how like we always joke about how oh, don't come to Japan and expect Japan to be like anime. This is like one of those times where Japan is like the anime movies. Except we also talked about that last episode <laughs> about how Japan's just like my anime. It's just like the movies. But so I don't know if we really say it's not like the anime that much. It did feel very like magical in a cheesy, not cheesy way where I was biking across this red bridge and it was a little bit stormy off the ocean and it was the sun was setting and i was like riding across to this island with a shrine on it and these cliffs and i was like mm. this is ridiculous but there's a little shrine over there and it's apparently where the deity the sea deities live and i, I believe it because it felt very <laughs> magical i didn't have a lot of time to like walk around because i knew you were waiting for me in the car so i didn't want to be like too just out there having a time but there's apparently a lighthouse on that island that i t- i don't know where that is so we gotta, we gotta go back and yeah it was very cool and then we made it home the end the end <laughs> well <laughs> do you have a word of the week yeah you go first oh so my word is sutomeru 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 yeah, so it means, like, to exert yourself. Oh. Oh, it's a verb. Yeah. Oh. Sutomemashita. Yeah. And I was trying to look it up, and it was very interesting, because I was trying to look up to, like, to endure. Like, you know, to have, like, endurance. Like, oh, like, you endured, like... Is it su or tsu? Tsu. With a T? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but all the indoors that I could find were, like you were putting up with like foul conditions oh. like you endured like the teacher's punishment oh. and it, yeah it was kind of like well that's like a not suffering the, yeah i was like looking for like persevere oh. so i think suta meru is like more like you persevered or you like overcame hmm. so yeah very nice what's yours todai which is lighthouse not because of the lighthouse that I didn't see on the little big island but because i saw a different lighthouse that i kind of ran out of time to mention but there was a lighthouse that was in wakayama that i got to go visit on a different island that i accessed from a bridge what a theme it's so just yeah, a you, nation of islands over if here. you like biking to different islands and finding little lighthouses and things you should definitely go to wakayama and fukui it's just like the anime <laughs> you'll love it <laughs> so i just wanted to mention we were talking about it today with my friends because they were asking what the word lighthouse is in english and i said it was lighthouse the kanji todai, the first one is light, but the second one is like pedestal. Dai, it's the same kanji you use to count machines. And also it's a support or a pedestal. It's like a, like a little light pedestal. Pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Todai. Todai. Okay, now we're done. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> you made it this far. Thanks for listening. Yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.